getting hit in the head is pretty much a guaranteed laugh. In the world of cartoons, TV shows, <laughs> and movies. But in the real world, it's not so funny. And as correspondent John Torres reports, these days, we're finding out that even a seemingly minor head injury can cause a lot more damage than we ever thought. Go! Good, good. Good job, Reed, good job. Reed Snyderman is 17. A high school junior, he plays varsity lacrosse, and he's the U.S. Junior Olympic champion in freestyle skiing. It was the last day of spring break in 2008 when his trouble started. I was at U.S. Nationals at the end of March, and I landed my top air, which was a back of iron cross. I was really aggressive, like charging it, because I really wanted to go for it, you know? And I ended up just kind of catching my edge and kind of flipping and hitting my head. and then being really bewildered and not really knowing what was going on. His coach went over to him first and came back to me and said that he thought he was fine, except he might have a mild concussion. But Reed was not fine at all. I was really out of it. Everything's out of sync. It was really difficult for my brain to maintain a train of thought. It, it was definitely scary. Almost four million athletes, boys and girls, suffer concussions every year. Many of them recover quickly, and a bang on the head is often considered just part of the game. You shake it off and get back to the field as soon as possible. But for 20% of patients diagnosed with a concussion, recovery isn't so easy. Because even when it's mild, a concussion is a traumatic brain injury. If you look at traumatic brain injury, it is the number one cause of death and disability in young people. Jam Kajar is a neurosurgeon at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York and an international expert in brain injuries. 90% of traumatic brain injury is concussion. And how many numbers are we talking about? There are millions. But concussions are difficult to diagnose. They generally don't show up on a standard MRI like the one I'm having now. So even if a patient has symptoms, understanding why is complicated. Take a look at my MRI compared to the MRI of a concussion patient. It looks normal. They both look completely normal. But this one's not normal. The patient has symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury. The neurologist would tell the patient, it looks normal to me. Your CAT scan's normal, your MRI's normal. So there's something else going on. MRIs produce images of gray matter, cells called neurons and their connections which make up most of the surface of the brain. Gray matter is organized into specific regions, which control functions like memory, speech, movement, and coordination. But a concussion doesn't usually do much damage to the gray matter. So now, neurologists are searching for clues deeper within the brain, in the white matter. The white matter makes up the sort of cables or connections between the lobes or the sections of the brain. Those white matter connections are like telephone trunk lines. They bundle nerve cells from different areas of the brain into networks, which work together to produce and regulate thoughts and actions. But if the white matter is damaged by a concussion, the connections could get disrupted, in theory at least. Until recently though, it was very difficult to see white matter on an MRI. To be able to really quantify and qualify the integrity of the white matter, you need to go to a specialized sequence like the DTI or diffusion tensor imaging. DTI or diffusion tensor imaging is a new way to bring white matter out of the shadows using advanced software to get more detailed information from an MRI image. Correct. When we bring up the DTI, you can really clearly see where the white matter is and where the gray matter is because on this, white is white, gray matter is gray. It's not only the color that's important, White matter helps diffuse water through brain cells, and that may be an important clue to what goes wrong in concussions. And so with the DTI, all we're doing is looking at where water is, pretty much. So if the water's not flowing well, that tells you there's some... If you have a leak in the pipe, we're going to be able to pick that up with the DTI. 
If you compare the left and the right, you can see these two tracks very clearly here, but you can see on this, you have the one on the outside and the one on the inside is disrupted. One part of the brain is not talking to the other one because it can't make it through that area. Right. And that's what causes the impairment they have later on. That's what we think. That's what our data shows, yes. Jam Gajar agrees. His theory is that tiny tears in the white matter caused by a concussion disrupt the brain's natural timing, like a telephone conversation gone wrong. One way for a normal person to feel like somebody with a concussion is to think of a cell phone conversation. Normally, when you talk on the cell phone, you talk, the other person talks, you go back and forth, and it's smooth, but then, like my voice right there, you're expecting my voice to come in. It didn't come in, and you went, you got an error signal. Gajar's theory is that microscopic tears in the white matter cause these error signals. They disrupt communication between different parts of the brain responsible for helping us to pay attention and remember what's going on around us. There are populations of cells that communicate with each other and produce brain function. If you disrupt the connections between these areas, you disrupt attention and memory. And please to test this idea, I'm participating in an experiment Gajar devised to measure a person's ability to pay attention. This device records how well my eyes stay in sync with a moving target. So these cameras are watching where my eyes are moving? Yes. We picked eye movements in terms of following a predictable target. And you can't drive your eyes in a circle automatically. You have to pay attention to the target when it's going around. For most people, this test is easy. My eyes follow the target with no break in the cycle. But for someone who has symptoms after a concussion, it's a different story. Ten years ago, artist Ann Shemp suffered a concussion in a car accident. Even after intense therapy, she still has problems with speech, memory, and attention. The first day I went into my studio, I looked at my materials and I couldn't figure out what I did with them. Like, I would pick up my... T is Excuse me, I'm having trouble with words. Words for familiar things don't always come easily. Like the paint. The paint, yeah, like I didn't remember what I did with it. Even though I looked around my studio and I could see my current painting that I was working on. So I turned around and I walked out. I'm still 10 years later having um, a lot of those difficulties. Put your chin right here. Let's see if you're nice and comfortable, okay. When Ann now, tries the eye tracking test, it's a struggle. What's happening with her is she's constantly having to start over again, and she's losing her train of thought. So here's a very predictable target. It's going around like this. My brain should be able to know it's going around like this and where, where the dot's going to be next. A head injury patient is just wobbly all over it. They're trying to synchronize the dot. Their timing is off, and as a consequence, they've got this variability, which is directly proportional to how good their, how good their attention is. Go. Go. For young athletes, problems with attention after a concussion can go way beyond the playing field. Definitely during school, I would like I would lose the entire class and I would lose the entire discussion in my classes and math was impossible for that week and I'm usually a really strong math student so it was really strange. Read that stick belong below the shoulder. Someone who's had a concussion may look like they should be able to participate, but they're not really aware of what they're doing at all. So that's a scary thought. But the most scary thought is sending a student who's had a concussion back into the game. This can happen because there's no way to objectively diagnose concussions on the sidelines, and young athletes most often don't want to be benched. But what if there were a tool to quickly and accurately assess if a brain injury has taken place? That's Jam Gajar's next goal. You can see this is He's very developing very a small portable version of the eye tracking system I tried in the lab. You put that on. And help demonstrate how it might work. So it's like a pair of regular glasses and I'll cinch it up here a little bit. How does it feel? Comfortable. Good? It's light. Okay. The same moving circle is projected directly onto the lens of the specially designed pair of glasses. Then a miniature camera records how well the eyes follow it. It's a quick way to tell if a concussion has taken place, impairing the brain's ability to pay attention to what's happening on the field. Let's go, let's go! And that's an essential piece of information, 
because an athlete who's had one concussion is at high risk for another. The person who's got poor attention, you don't want to send them back into play. Send them back in, they are unable to pay attention and they get another injury. You keep on adding those concussions together, then you see things like dementia and so on you know, later in life. Gajar's theory is still being tested, but the potential to diagnose concussions quickly and accurately is an appealing idea to Reed's coach. It would just take all of the risks out of the equation. Something that is able to confirm a trauma to the brain, but takes the conjecture out of everyone's hands and says, this is what we have to do. Six weeks after his concussion, Reed has made a full recovery. Don't crowd him. Don't crowd him, Steve. But the experience stays with him every time he heads onto the field or the slopes. I think a concussion is one of the scariest injuries that you can get. Like, I mean, when you break your arm, you're still you. You still can think. You still can, you know, you can function fine. But, but when, you, when you hurt your brain, even, even when it's minor, even when it's not major, it, it's, like, it's like you're not you for a while and that's definitely frightening.